Good morning. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Cecily Sessions from the Air Force Medical Service. Um, I'm a physician, pediatrician, and PrevMed by training. I am not a geneticist, contrary to popular belief among some of my own leadership. Uh, but I want to uh, thank, in particular, um, my Surgeon General, uh, Tom Travis, for extending an invitation, um, which resulted in so many uniforms being uh, present today. In particular, I'd like to acknowledge um, Admiral Dahl and Admiral Dollymore uh, for being present. Um, I know you are extremely busy, so thank you for taking this time um, out of your schedules. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the um, literal army of uh, cl clinical geneticists who responded to this invitation who are um, hopefully uh, listening to us um, or watching us online. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Okay. So um, our program um, is called Patient-Centered Precision Care, um, PC2Z. Um, in the Air Force, we use the Z ending to indicate that we're doing something that we think is innovative and cool. Um, so genomic medicine research falls into that bucket for us. Um, it's our comprehensive effort to prepare infrastructure for genome-informed personalized medicine um, and collaborate with academia, industry, and federal partners to achieve those goals. Uh, at the top of the slide, you see the quadruple aim for the military health system, readiness, better care, better health, and best value, and some of the things that we're doing in the PC2Z program that align with those goals. PC2Z is intended to be a comprehensive approach, and we have a four pillars um, that we're addressing through the program. Uh, one of those is bioinformatics. Uh, another is education, um, research. We're actually doing um, research projects, and I'll give you a list of those shortly. And then we're also addressing um, LC and policy issues in the fourth pillar. Our overall long-term goals are to enhance military readiness, improve um, health care in our system, and to mitigate additional costs, um, either through reducing duplicative testing or realizing the benefits of genome-informed medicine in our system. Our Surgeon General's vision for personalized medicine uh, is to galvanize research using seed funding because um, the Air Force um, has only a small seed of funding compared to some of our sister services, um, to model collaboration and create a strategic body of clinical knowledge that can be used throughout our healthcare system, um, to demonstrate the translation of omics into clinical practice. and. Um, General Travis feels the third one is most important, to anticipate the translation um, that's happening in this rapidly advancing field um, and to create evidence-based, state-of-the-art care for our entire beneficiary population. Along the way, we hope to um, develop strategies that complement our current primary care model, which is the patient-centered medical home, and uh, to work in partnership with sister services and um, other partners um, to make sure that we can do this in an effective way across our health system. Um, just a, a sidebar comment, and whenever I do my sidebars, as you know, this, these are my own opinions and do not represent um, the uh, official position of my department or uh, the DOD. Um, we mentioned that um, we're moving towards actually integrating those systems, and I think Dr. Cheatham alluded to that earlier. Uh, the Defense Health Agency will be standing up on 1 October um, of this year, and I'm excited to see what kind of transformation we can see um, with that officially taking place, which is what my recruiter told me when I signed up 20 years ago, um, that that would already be in place. Uh, so it didn't matter which uniform I wore because it would all be purple anyway. So I'm glad to see that I am still alive uh, in a uniform to see that happen. So um, one of the shared services under that Defense Health Agency model is research and development. Um, so I've been trying to um, make sure that this topic is on the minds of our leadership so that it's considered as we are standing up that function. Um, in addition, um, we are trying to utilize our unique capability, which I know Terry was alluding to and trying to get uh, garner some support for that, um, because I do think that we have, although we don't have an entirely cohesive system, um, we do have an electronic health record. Um, we do have a central um, repository for that data at the Armed Forces Health Surveillance Center, and um, we do have about a ni 9 million or so um, folks who are enrolled as beneficiaries of our system. So just, again, as an aside, my opinion, um, we have that electronic health record, we have a central repository, but there are plenty of things that fall through the, through the cracks, as I realized um, in preparing for my next assignment. Um, my daughter is seeking care at Bethesda. Uh, my husband and son um, seek care at another facility on the same campus as Walter Reed. Um, their records, their immunization records are in the system so that when I go into my readiness portal, I can actually download my son's shot records. I can't download my daughter's because she's seeking care at a facility that's Navy and Army and they didn't put it into the Air Force immunization record system. So 
I had to print out a copy from, get, get a hand, uh, hard copy from Bethesda and walk that over to an Air Force immunization clinic so that that information can be, as we say, fat fingered into the Air Force system. So we do have a record. We do have centralized storage, storage but of course there are always uh, things that fall through the cracks. So I mentioned that I would get into detail about uh, what we have in our research portfolio. Um, the big one, um, the one that I'm constantly defending is at the top. Um, that's our involvement with the Coriel Personalized Medicine Collaborative and our clinical utility study. Um, this one is, uh, we're at about 80% of our enrollment goal right now. Uh, we have been exclusively enrolling folks who are part of the um, healthcare team for the Air Force Medical Service um, under the assumption that hopefully we're a little bit um, better educated about what's going on in genomics and that we will reach out to our colleagues um, to get those questions answered um, or educate ourselves um, rather than pushing the panic button. Uh, but this study allows um, for individualized risk reporting back to the participant only um, based on uh, SNPs, um, self-reported family history, and um, self-reported uh, personal and health um, lifestyle choices. So that one is supposed to be a longitudinal study. Um, it allows the Air Force Medical Service to be an arm of an existing study since, I think that's been going on since 2008, um, that has about 6,000 folks enrolled in what we call the civilian cohort, and our goal is to enroll uh, 2,000 Air Force Medical Service providers. Um, the next uh, few studies, uh, all started in um, FY12 as part of our broad agency announcement. Um, epigenetic biomarkers of stress at high altitude conditions is a mouse study. Uh, I always smile when I say that, Dr. Miller. Um, but this one looks at a validated model for post-traumatic stress disorder in mice and then is evaluating um, how hypoxia can impact that and looking for epigenetic biomarkers that predict um, that outcome. Um, the next two studies, Generating Change and Genetic Risk Testing and Health Coaching and gen Genetically Guided Statin Therapy, um, both are in partnership with Duke University, thank you Dr. Ginsburg, and um, some of our researchers at Travis Air Force Base, um, and those will be doing just what they say. So um, one is looking at type 2 diabetes and um, coronary artery disease um, and looking at genetic risk factors and then using um, certified health coaches to guide participants through what that information means and how that informs um, their treatment plans. And then genetically guided statin therapy um, is looking at um, using uh, pharmacogenomics um, around statins. Um, the Cellular sen Sentinels Toxicity Platform is using um, stem cells to model um, toxicity response and looking for biomarkers that are predictive of that. Um, the, the next study is uh, but not in my portfolio, but part of um, the autism research that we have ongoing um, through the Air Force Medical Support Agency that began as a congressional um, funded project and is now um, something that we're funding. Uh, but this one is looking at um, modifiers, um, genetic modifiers that um, are predictive of asthma and obesity. And then the next one um, is building on the registry of uh, children with autism and their parents um, that was created through an earlier project and then going and doing triad genotyping of the parents and children um, who are in that registry. Um, pending because of uh, sequestration and lack of FY13 funds are the last two studies, um, a rapid learning system for delivery of personalized health care, also in partnership with Dr. Ginsburg and his Center for Personalized Medicine at Duke, and um, implementation, adoption, and utility of family history in diverse care settings, which would be another collaborative between Duke University and Travis Air Force Base. Um, which was um, something that we pursued through an NHGRI grant. Obstacles that I think are unique to our system. Um, so we do have, uh, I said, we have a, a centralized um, electronic health record. We do have uh, biorepositories. Um, but we also have regulatory constraints um, around, in particular, um, the inability to use tests in our systems that are not um, FDA approved. So laboratory developed tests um, are not something that we are able to order when we specifically <coughs> indicate that we are ordering those tests um, outside of um, FDA guidance about um, how those should be implemented. Uh, national security concerns about biobanking bio and data sharing. Um, my, my geneticists tell me that uh, even if we try to strip identifiers from the data and um, if we publish a sequence in its entirety, that there are ways of reverse engineering um, someone's identity based on existing um, publicly available uh, data about uh, mapping people's DNA to their 
um, their area code and their, their surname. Um, so because of that, um, every time that we talk about doing one of these collaborative partnerships where we're sharing data or talk about storing our sequence data in dbGaP, um, this is something that we need to make sure that we're mindful of. <clears throat> Information assurance. Um, this is something that we've been dealing with um, in a very um, substantive way um, as part of the Coriel project. Um, we've enrolled about um, 1,600 people into the, the Coriel study. Um, we're supposed to be marrying up their genomic sequence data and electronic health record data from our system, but we can't do that until we have met information assurance um, guidance about uh, the IT system where that data will be stored, which is translated into us needing to purchase and configure um, that IT system and then um, export it to Coriel um, for them to plug in so that we can transfer the data to them. Uh, we already mentioned, I'll just pass over the financial stuff because I don't want to get myself in trouble. Um, the, the more important one is um, operational versus clinical omics. <clears throat> now, I, I will um, give the caveat that I'm, you know, I've, I've been in uniform for a little while, but I'm relatively naive when it comes to practicing medicine in a stateside uh, military facility. Um, also, I, I t as a pediatrician, I, I tend to be somewhat of an idealist. So in my function in, the, in this job for the last couple of years, I have tried to draw a line um, in the sand between what I call operational genomics and clinical genomics. So I like to, I like very much Dr. Manolio's narrow definition of what clinical uh, genomic medicine is, which is that we're using that genomic information um, in the course of clinical care. There are many other research um, groups and <clears throat> people um, who would like to use that type of data um, for more operationally relevant concerns. And I do not wish them any ill will. I just don't want that to be part of my portfolio and this program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Therefore, I have tried to draw that line in the sand. However, as Admiral Dahl rightly pointed out, for, this, for genomic medicine or personalized medicine to be something that's truly embraced by the military healthcare system, we have to do it in such a way that it is operationally relevant. So walking that fine line between, sorry, I have a fog. <clears throat> that fine line between something that is operationally relevant um, and something that is of operational significance, that's, that's really, that's a, an obstacle to me. Um, trying to find out trying to figure out um, where we can implement personalized medicine and genomic medicine in a way that's clinically responsible in a system where, and this gets to the last one down there, privacy concerns, where it's a st standard practice in our healthcare system that if something in someone's medical care could impact their ability to perform their job or could impact the mission, um, we don't have that privacy, that doctor-patient privilege um, that normally exists um, outside of uh, military treatment facilities. So that's something that I'm, I'm not senior enough to navigate. I've, I've only been in the position of saying that in the patient-centered precision care program so far, um, we've only addressed the clinical genomics aspect and tried to distance ourselves from people who are trying to use genomics for human performance enhancement, as an example. Um, so privacy concerns I mentioned and lack of coverage under GINA. This is not to say that we want GINA amended um, to include us, simply to say that um, in its current configuration, uh, it does not apply to members of the U.S. military seeking care in our system through TRICARE. Um, it does not apply to veterans obtaining health care through the VA <clears throat> or through people, uh, for people who are seeking care in the Indian Health um, service. So I think everyone's familiar with it. It protects individuals from discrimination by health insurers or employers. It doesn't cover disability or long-term care insurance, um, but it does not apply to um, folks in my situation. So um, Senator Kennedy said it was the first civil rights bill in the new century of the life sciences. Um, there's a lot of confusion and when I talk to my colleagues in uniform about uh, they think sometimes that the N is for non-disclosure. Um, when it's in fact uh, for non-discrimination, there's a big difference there. Um, so in practical terms, um, it has really contributed to the fear factor around folks who are um, considering participating in research projects that we're engaging in um, because they 
don't want that information to be disclosed to their um, employer, insurer, healthcare team, which for us is all um, a single entity um, if, you know, when you boil it down. Um, so as I mentioned before, readiness and operational concerns can trump um, confidentiality, and that's another um, concern that is unique to service members. So partly to address that issue and partly because it was part of the original vision for this program, um, we have been meeting um, informally as the Precision Care Advisory Panel. Um, at the time, General Travis was the Air Force Deputy Surgeon General. He invited his counterparts to um, uh, appoint representatives. Um, so we had Air Force, Army, Navy, um, Health and Human Services, um, VA, and Health Affairs Tri TRICARE Medical Authority representation. Uh, at the beginning of this year, I had the opportunity to um, present this information to Dr. Warren Laquette, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Clinical Programs and Policy, and he invited me to make this presentation to the Clinical Proponency Steering Committee. All that to say, um, we are being formally chartered as a work group um, that reports to his office. Um, that is up for a vote virtually, not that I'm advertising, uh, very shortly, and I'm, hoping, I'm hopeful that our charter will be formalized um, in the next couple of weeks. Um, in that charter, the proposed objectives are seen here, um, gathering evidence um, about translating genomic-based personalized medicine into the clinical workflow in our system, and then providing um, policy, scientific, and operational recommendations and approaches to support genetic screening, counseling, and healthcare services for service members and beneficiaries. Our deliverables, uh, the first one is what I was alluding to earlier with the slides about GINA. Um, we need to draft genetic information non-discrimination policy for DOD and or the VA if they'd like to uh, partner with us on that. Um, we need to create awareness of genomics and omics within our system, um, not only for the healthcare team but also for beneficiaries, and then um, review the existing constraints, some of which I outlined in this presentation, and deliver recommendations with respect to genomic-based personalized medicine implementation in our clinical system. So some of the strategic partnerships that uh, this program has initiated, uh, Dr. Manolio and others mentioned the eMERGE network, and we're extremely pleased to be um, affiliates um, of that organization. Um, we also are on the Institute of Medicine Genomics Roundtable, and thank you, Adam, for your support of that. Um, the integra integrator for our program has been uh, the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. Um, they have facilitated our outreach with academia um, and industry in their position as a university-affiliated research center. I mentioned our study with the Coriel Institute for Medical Research and the ongoing study that we have um, to look at omics and provide kind of a train-the-trainer situation with hands-on access um, for providers and learning about how to interpret our own um, genome-informed um, risk reports. Uh, I mentioned several um, collaborative um, research projects that we have ongoing with Dr. Ginsburg and the Duke University Center for Personalized Medicine. Um, also, thank you to Joan for her support of our, our last two symposia um, through the National Coalition for Health Professional Education and Genetics. And I mentioned um, in great detail our Precision Care Advisory Panel. And thank you to um, Dr. Cheatham and others who've been supportive of that effort. Opportunities. Um, We've talked with um, Dr. Przgowski and um, several members of his team um, about collaborating more closely with the Million Veterans Program. Um, I mentioned to Dr. Coopersmith when I saw him at the PMC uh, luncheon the other day um, that I have initiated a data request um, to share um, historic EHR data from the DOD system for a cohort of um, folks who've enrolled in the Million Veterans Program so that you have some phenotypic data um, from when they were with us. Uh, I also mentioned the stand-up of the Defense Health Agency and that opportunity for shared services in research and development. Um, the Joint Program Committee set up at Fort Detrick, and my, understand, my limited understanding of them is that they are um, in charge of joint um, research dollars for um, the military medical system. Um, we have less of a presence there, but as part of this um, transition that's been happening over the last few months and that's continuing, um, we will, the Air Force will be um, developing a larger presence there and trying to um, preferentially put our good projects up there rather than um, funding the, the projects that we think are really worthwhile with blue money, with Air Force money, and then sending the leftovers up there, which is the way we've done it so far. Um, the barter system. This is my way of annotating um, the fact that, as Dr. Ginsburg and Dr. Manolio alluded, um, we have EHR capability. Um, we have a, a large beneficiary population. We have a relatively standardized system of care. That's what we bring to the table. We're less able to um, bring um, 
large amounts of money to the table to fund um, research projects, but we do have a community of researchers um, who are willing um, and definitely um, eager um, to work with partners um, in terms of lever leveraging those capabilities. And I want to thank um, NHGRI uh, for welcoming us um, with open arms over the last couple of years and uh, making a lot of these opportunities that you see on these slides possible. Any questions for me? <laughs>